Tonight on Free Minds TV, the Swedish tax authorities are going after parents of nameless children to face them with some pretty hefty fines. Also, if you're planning on going to Times Square this New Year's Eve, be ready for some pretty heavy police force as 1,000 new police recruits will be carrying automatic machine guns. We're also going to be getting into the Downsizer Dispatch and a whole lot more, all tonight on Free Minds TV. And welcome to Free Minds TV, a special holiday edition. As always, it's Toby here with you. And Nick. I'd like to invite the viewers to log on to our website, freemindstv.com. From there, there's all the show content, a discussion on the forums, ways to help the show, and a whole lot more, freemindstv.com. All right, we have a lot of articles to get to tonight. I want to start off with going over to Sweden. You know, uh, the Swedish tax collectors are pretty upset with parents who have not named their children, or at least not reported to name their children, to the tax authorities. Yes, as soon as you have a kid, Sweden would like you to register that kid and tell them their name so that they can someday tax them. Um, this coming from UPI.com. An agency is sending out letters to parents who take too long on giving their first names to children with the tax registry. The letters uh, the, agent, uh, the agency began sending uh, earlier this year threatened parents with fines up to $1,200 for each child who is not properly named. Now, you and I both know that it's absolutely for tax collecting reasons. They don't want to, uh, um, they want these kids to have names so that they can tax them. But the Swedish authorities are putting it in a different light. Here's a quote from the article. Um, it's every child's right to have a name, said Thomas Norgren of the tax agency. He said that the agency officials decided to step up the enforcement on the law after they learned the number of children in the registry without names. Um, so they're going after this with the child needs to have a name. What are these parents thinking? Not naming their children. How do they go to school and um, have kids play with them? Who do they play with if they don't have a name? These poor children, they don't have names. Now, here's just a little tip for you genius tax authorities over in Sweden. You're just not having them registered because the parents don't want to tell you. Idiots. Yeah, I mean, obviously they're going to try to put the spin on it like the parents aren't naming the children. But, I mean, come on, you're going to call the child something. You're not just going to say, hey, you, for the first five or six years <laughs> of their life. So, hey, you, kid. Yeah, so, I mean. <laughs> I haven't decided what I'm going to call you yet, but. <laughs> it just boils down to nobody really, I don't think people really like the tax man, even in Sweden, which is a pretty socialist country, high tax country, welfare state and all that. I still don't think people really like the tax man. That's why they're not reporting these names to the authorities. That doesn't mean the children don't have a name. You know, there was a time in many countries before you had all kinds of electronic databases where the government didn't have your name on file. Oh my gosh, what did we do? Did but, the wheels still turn? The wheels on the bus went round and round anyways? I, I think people just kind of used the name along. like it was theirs, even though the government didn't give them permission to use a name. Now, you know, the... <laughs> The tax agency thinks that there's only 400 of these kids. They said that they're concentrating on going after 400 kids that they know uh, have no names. Uh, well, they, they have names. They just don't, you just don't know their names. And there's a lot more than 400 of them out there. In all of Sweden, um, I think that there's more than 400 people, Mr. Taxman, that haven't reported the names of their kids to you because they don't want you to know. And why is it your business anyways? Why do you need to know? They don't want you to know, so just leave it as that. But I'm sure they will. I think here in America, you don't need to give your name until later because it's actually a tax credit that you get for having a kid. I don't know how well, it works in Sweden. Well, you need a social Sweden. security number. I didn't get my social security number until I was, well, I think, seven. That's true. A lot of people, I guess, don't get them until they... Some people don't get them until they enter the workforce, and then they actually have to go and get them. But Because you don't have to do it at birth. They encourage you strongly to do it these days at the hospital. But you don't have to. Yeah. I, I mean, life will go on even if you're not not registered properly with the government. Uh, there's a novel thought out there, but hey, we're putting it out there. Thinking outside the box, you know, people? All right, let's move along. Let's get into New Year's celebrations, because it is that holiday season. We want to give you all the hard-hitting news. Where are you going to be this New Year's Eve? Well, I know I'm not going to be at Times Square, because I don't like a police state. Um, a couple of weeks back, we were talking about the uh, Mumbai, is that how you say it? Mumbai. The yeah, Mumbai the terrorist, terrorist attacks. attacks. Well, anyways, that was a pretty scary uh, place. A lot of uh, terrorists um, came, um, rushed in and shot a whole unarmed populace. 
of people who had no way to defend themselves. And the police who were there, although they were armed, didn't really do much to save people. But New York won't let that happen. They're making preparations, and they are training 1,000 of their well, not finest, they're brand new recruit, uh, uh, recruits, police officers, uh, with automatic M4 machine guns who will be at present at the New Year, New Year celebrations in Times Square. Now it should be noticed that there have been absolutely no uh, threats against Times Square, but you got to be prepared, right? Because you couldn't just arm the populace and allow people to defend themselves. This is the government's work. So they are taking these brand new recruits and giving them uh, machine guns. Now it should be noted that only 400 cops in an elite emergency force currently use these guns. Now they're giving them to a thousand brand newbies off the street. Um, these brand newbies will be giving um, three days of training, which will, will not be actual training. It will be called familiarization because real training takes uh, over two weeks. These are machine guns. They get real training with just a regular gun and they're just being familiarized when they're using fully automatic M4 machine guns. Smart idea, right? Yeah, and you know, nobody knows exactly how many guns are in New York City in private hands because for the most part they're illegal. They've made it so hard to own guns there. But I've heard estimates of about 2 million guns in New York City in the hands of private citizens. And the police still have guns. Why do you need this many people walking around with M4s? I think it's more a show of force than anything that would actually deter a terrorist attack or being able to respond to it. Right, I'm, I'm still of the opinion, although we did catch a lot of flack when we talked about this, of uh, the Mumbai people, if they actually had had some guns, they could have prevented this because they got slaughtered because there were a few people who had arms um, shooting a bunch of people who didn't. So just a few people who were armed could have ended this immediately. Uh, but of course, of course, we got a whole lot of hate mail saying, you guys are crazy, you put arms in the, po the hands of the populace and all hell will break loose. So, like it does here in New Hampshire. I mean, we have so many shootings in the streets. I know. I know. I you can't walk to the grocery store without being shot a couple yeah. times. Same, it's the same in Vermont and Alaska and Montana. But and New York, there, there's <laughs> where things are safe, where the police will be carrying around automatic weapons. Um, really, it looks to me like an intimidation for us citizens because there's been no threat on Times Square in New York. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the police think they're trying to do here, but it's not making me feel safer. It's just making me feel like I live in a police state. So congratulations, New York. <laughs> All right, Nick. Uh, we want, we've talked about it from time to time. It's kind of a reoccurring edition of this week's Downsizer Dispatch. It's one of the, the main reasons that Downsizer DC got going off the ground, got their feet off the ground, and that's going in with Read the Bills Act with Downsize DC. Uh, can you tell the viewers about it a little bit? Um, well, what they're trying to do over at Downsize DC is pass a law that would make Congress read the bills. A uh, congressperson would either have to read the bill, sign an affidavit saying they read the bill, or sit in Congress and have the bill read to them. So they would have that option. Um, but they would have to know what was in every bill, the full text of the legislation before they voted on it, because the fact is Congress doesn't read most of what they pass. They don't really even read a fraction of what they pass. The Patriot Act was hundreds of pages long, for example, and it was made available only a few hours before people were supposed to vote on it. It just wasn't physically possible to read the legislation. And I believe that only one copy was made available for each side of the House. So you had hundreds of people who were supposed to somehow share hundreds of pages of legislation and read all of it within the course of a few hours before they voted on it. There's no way that Congress could pass the amount of legislation that it does today and actually represent you. And in any other sphere, uh, if you had a lawyer that was telling you to sign a contract, um, without reading it, th there's due diligence involved. If you're going to be voting on something, you should know what you're voting on. Otherwise, it's just negligent. Um, there's been over 140,000 messages to date sent to Congress through DC.org asking Congress to, asking Congress people to sponsor legislation that would make Congress read the bills before they voted on them and, you know, encouraging lawmakers to vote for that if it comes to a vote. Now, Congress people don't like this because it means they can't pass all of the, the pork barrel spending that they spend. They can't pass the, the, just the amount of legislation that they pass. It would limit the role of government. It would limit the amount of growth we could see out of government. And I think that's a good thing. I, I want my elected officials to be reading legislation before they pass it because they're ignorant about what the law is. They tell you that ignorance of the law is no excuse. If you're arrested for a crime, well, you 
should have known that it was a law. These Congress people don't know that it's a law. It's physically impossible for them to know everything that they voted for, unless they're voting no most of the time. So go to downsizedc.org, sign up for their email list, and use their Educate the Powerful system to tell your congressperson that you would like them to read the bills before they vote on them. You know, Nick, it's just such a novel idea. Maybe I'm just overthinking things here, but doesn't it make sense for a representative who you voted for to represent you to actually read and understand what they're voting for? Otherwise, how can they possibly represent you if they don't even know what they're voting on half the time? Yeah, and you know, you think it might tell you something. If you have a system of government where p things are supposed to be voted on, on, but you're passing so many laws that there just simply isn't time for you know people whose profession it is to read bills and vote on them. If, if they don't have enough time to read a fraction of the legislation that's being passed, you need to step back and say, maybe we're passing too much legislation. Maybe a lot of this stuff either shouldn't be legislated at all or should be left to the states and localities to legislate instead of doing it all in Washington. It would make sense to me, but for some reason, politicians at least don't step back. Most of the American people think the federal government is way too big. You know, this bill, the fact that this bill, uh, Downsize DC, has been for years now trying to pass this bill or and get sponsors of this bill with, um, well, they've gotten a lot of people contacting their representatives. Hunt thousands and thousands of people have been contacting their representatives asking them to um, pass this bill, yet they haven't done anything about it. And this proves to me that the government is going nowhere. They're, they're not doing what they're supposed to be because they don't care about this bill. There's actually a hat trick of three bills that I really, really, really like at Downsize DC. It's Read the Bills Act, which would be do huge amounts to limit the size of the federal government and growth of the federal government. There's One Subject at a Time Act, which I'm also a huge uh, fan of. It says you can only have one subject per bill, so you're voting on one law, not thousands of different pork barrel spending laws or things that you don't even know about being wrapped up into that bill. And then finally, Write the Laws Act. I mean, they, the Congress people who vote on these laws and that you all have to follow, they don't even write them themselves. They outsource them to some lawyers who put them into gobbledygook that even if they did read the bills, they wouldn't be able to understand. And so, a lot of federal laws now are passed without a vote of Congress. Uh, the DEA has criminalized certain drugs just through their administrative courts without your elected officials having any chance to vote on them. Uh, the ATF and many other government agencies do the same thing. They're essentially unelected bureaucracies. They're appointed by the president, and they can write laws, which is n not how the Constitution set up Absolutely. our form of government. The Congress passes laws, and the executive branch is in charge of enforcing them, not writing them. Yeah, so there's a whole lot of good stuff. Those ones, though, if any one of those three got through, it would do huge things. But all three of them got three, we might, I might not want to get rid of the federal government so bad. But anyways, right now, they're pretty useless. But with these bills passed, who knows? Downsizedc.org. All right, when we come back, we're going to be getting into some predictions uh, for what will happen in the world before 2012. Uh, one man's got them. Nick, you've got the list. We're also going to be getting into some dangerous weaponry being sold over in the UK. All that and a whole lot more. Stay tuned. This is Free Minds TV. Free Minds TV is brought to you in part by AnarchyInYourHead.com, a comic about freedom. When it comes to politics, they hate just about everyone, so they're bound to make fun of someone that you don't like eventually. AnarchyInYourHead.com, that's AnarchyInYourHead.com. Free Minds TV is brought to you in part by Life Productions for your basic and semi-pro video production needs. From full wedding and event coverage to DVD authoring and distributions, LifeProductions.com, that's L-Y-F-Productions.com. I'm Sam with OTN, and you're watching Free Minds TV, one of the few media sources that asks you to think for yourself. And welcome back to Free Minds TV. As always, it's Toby here with you. And Nick. All right, Nick. They say by, by 2012, the world will end, will all collapse, and there will be hu no humanity left. At least that's what I've seen a lot of on the website and on the Internet, perusing around the tubes. Um, what do you say? What's going to happen by 2012? Personally, well, I don't really look at the doomsday side of things. I don't think that the world will no. come to a screeching halt and we'll all fall off it. But some people do. Other people think other things. What's going to happen before then? Uh, well, this doesn't have much to do with any of these doomsday apocalyptic scenarios. But it's, they, this prediction does sound a lot like that. Uh, Gerald uh, Salente, he's the CEO of Trends Research Institute. 
Well, he's predicted a lot of things accurately before they happened, like the breakup of the Soviet Union, the 1987 stock market collapse, and our current economic mess. And he's making some predictions about what's going to happen in the U.S. over the next four years. And it's not good. Um, he's widely respected as one of the most accurate um, forecasters for world trends and economic trends. And he's, um, he's predicting... Uh, the possibility that there will be a massive economic depression, um, going so far as to say that by the year 2012, the United States may have lost its status as a developed nation and essentially returned to something that you would see in the developing world or the third world. So, so see, what type of a country are you talking about? Because right um, now we're kind of on top right now. It's, uh, we're close to the top, falling very quickly. This, but anyways, we're still near the top. It, it doesn't we mean we're going to become Afghanistan, but it could mean that we'll become something like Mexico. Mexico. Um, Not even Canada? How about we go for Canada? Uh, no, no, I think okay. what he's going for is something more like Canada, where uh, Mexico, where our industrial base is, gets wiped out and our middle class is getting wiped out. Um, that, that did happen to Mexico. They, you know, they weren't quite as high up to begin with, but they had a monetary crisis that really trashed their economy, and that's why we see people fleeing that country to the United States just to find work uh, that most Americans wouldn't want to do. Um, he's also predicting that there, um, there will be civil unrest, possibly a revolution, marked by food riots, squatter rebellions, tax revolts, and job marches, and he predicts that in the future, holidays will be more about obtaining food, not gifts. And I'm really not making this up. This, uh, this isn't my prediction. Um, nobody has a crystal ball, but this guy ha has been accurate. Yeah, in the what past. did he do? Why do I believe this guy? I mean, I could say some crazy stuff too, Nick. Why do I care what this guy has to say? Um, he also successfully predicted the nine, before it happened the 1997 Asian currency crisis, the subprime mortgage collapse, the ma massive devaluation of the U.S. dollar. Um, is he psychic a lot of or other is he stuff. just looking no, he's, into... No, I mean, he's just a trans analyst, so he's not always right on the money, but he's looking at current world affairs. So he doesn't have a crystal ball. He's not no, pretending well, he's, to be a psychic. He's just no. looking at trends and seeing what the, our, the laws that we're passing and the direction the government's going and what that's going to do to us? Uh, right. I mean, he's just looking at the fact that the productive economy is shrinking because, because of the way our credit markets are set up. Our economy's based on debt. That's kind of a house of cards that's collapsing right now. And instead, of, the government is probably not going to step back. What they're going to do is squeeze individual taxpayers and the overall productive economy more with much higher taxes that, that prevent a real recovery. And he's not the only one predicting something like this. Um, the British Ministry of Defense released a report last year which was looking on a longer horizon, but they were predicting that within 30 years the growing gap between the super rich and the middle class, um, along with the urban underclass, um, would threaten social order in the Western world. And you could see the middle classes become a revolutionary class um, and see nation states toppled, see civil unrest, see economies come to a screeching You said hall. yours wasn't gloom and doom predictions, Nick. I said That's it, pretty well, doom and gloom predictions. Th this is not, it is. It, it is so serious. So what am I supposed to do about this? I mean, that's four years away. You're saying I'm not going to be able to find food for Christmas? Well, food might be harder to come by. I mean, that's... So what do I do? Um, stock up on food. Uh, I would invest money in, in things like gold and silver uh, because he is predicting that the dollar could, by the end of this, be, dev be devalued by as much as 90% from its current value. You. There um, go my student loan debts. Right. So Boom. think of a <laughs> think of like a dollar, uh, ten dollars in a few years buying what a dollar buys today. A hundred dollars would only buy what ten dollars buys today. So a few gallons of gas might cost you a hundred dollars, hmm. um, which is you know that's happened in many other countries before, and you do see civil unrest. People think it can't happen in the U.S., but it's not necessarily the end of the world, and the future is unwritten. So depending on how we act. Um, maybe we can influence the government not to kind of screw us over or exacerbate this crisis. Um, maybe people will keep things nonviolent. It's, it's hard to say, though. So well, we'll, we'll see. I mean, the future is hard to predict. Nobody can do it with any certainty. And that's, that's all. That's depressing. I want to get into something that's, well, it's depressing if you really look at it. But yeah, I'm it taking is. this from the humorous side of things. So I'm perusing the Internet doing the stumble upon thing, which just gets you to a random picture that you might find humorous on the internet. When I came across this gem, now what, what you guys are looking at is a picture 
taken from a UK store sign front. Uh, in the UK, they have some pretty strict penalties. Uh, here, we're trying to keep our rights to bear firearms. In the UK, they're trying to keep their rights to hold on to those butter knives and forks and, and, and spoons. Now, is a, is a fork one of the prohibited items? Is that a cutting well, implement, or is that just... You know, let, let me just read the sign uh, for people who can't see it. On the store sign, which is in the window for the people who are listening to the audio po po podcast and aren't seeing the screen, there's a store window that is filled with a display of forks, uh, butter knives, and spoons, and on the front of it is a sign that reads, sale of, uh, sale of knives and bladed articles. Oh, no. Ar Artices? Uh, anyways, I, I spelt this wrong on my paper. I typed it on. The sale of these products is governed by the uh, Offensive Weapons Act of 1996, as amended by the Violent Crime Reduction Act of 2006. Um, it is a criminal offense to sell these products to any person under the age of 18. So I didn't go into these laws. I don't know if the fork is prohibited or if it's the butter knife that's prohibited. Either one, they look is like... Is it the spoon? It could be the spoon. Could it you be know, the spoon? Because you could sharpen that edge with a file. I'd hate to be killed by a spoon. Like, if I'm going for it, I'd rather be killed by a fork than a spoon. So I think the knife gonna, would be your best option. If you're, you're going to make one of them illegal, I'd like to make the spoon illegal because that seems like it would be the most painful to die by. But then again, the, the butter knife might hurt too and the fork wouldn't be very pleasant. So let's ban them all. I don't know why people eat. Uh, what do they do at the dinner table? If you've got to be 18 to buy a fork or a spoon um, or a butter knife, or whatever these violent weapons are, these offensive violent weapons. I didn't go through all the articles. I did look it up and the show content is posted at forum.freeminds.tv.com if you want to check out these, the, these long lists of prohibited items, uh, including spoons, forks, and knives that you have to be 18 to purchase in the UK. Uh, it just seems ridiculous. I mean, do they not think that these kids are going to be using sporks, spoons, and knives at the dinner table? Well, apparently they can't buy them. And if you don't have any parents who are willing to buy you a fork, spoon, and knife, well, you're up the creek without a paddle because you're in trouble. You've got to be 18 to buy these weapons, and they have some pretty ridiculous laws there. What do you do if you have to buy a steak knife? I think those are prohibited for anything but kitchen use. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of remarkable and what a lot of advocates of things like gun control in the United States and disarmament in the United States say is that, well, we'll never have a slippery slope, which is what usually gun rights advocates and, and <laughs> self-defense advocates are saying, well, if you can ban guns, what's next? Do we start banning sharp knives? Because well, I think they went to swords next, then they to. went to knives, and then they went to forks. <laughs> right, but we can see uh, supposedly a civilized nation over in the UK not, not allowing its citizens to possess if, steak knife. Like, you can't carry a steak knife. If you go to the Wendy's and buy a baked potato, do they have Wendy's in the UK? Maybe. If you go to Wendy's and buy a baked potato, can you get a fork or a spork or something to eat it with? Or do you have to be accompanied by a guardian to do that, too? How bad can the nanny state get? It is ridiculous. It'll, I, somehow it'll get worse in the UK. I always think that they can't. They aren't Everything gonna be able must to make be it any eaten worse. by straw. I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they'll just go to plastic, but then they're they're all into plastic the plastic is dangerous, man. Well, it's bad for the environment too. They have the environmentalism oh, yes. thing going on in the UK, so they, people probably wouldn't want to use plastic. They probably think that was worse than the dangerous metal knives. Yeah, you know, it's a dangerous world out there. So if you're that scared of it, maybe think about moving to the UK. They're pretty scared of the world too. But. We have other things to move on to. Nick, you've got an article about globalization. Yes. It's more scary stuff, though, I hear. Uh, it sort of is. Um, and this isn't talking about political globalization. I, you know, I think, for the most part, free trade across borders, it's a good thing. I mean, people will complain that, well, there's some social ills that come from that. Well, whenever you have change, you know, there are going to be stresses put on some people. But overall, I think free trade between countries is a good thing. This is talking about a political kind of globalism. And um, this is written by Justin Raimundo over at antiwar.com. But antiwar.com is pretty sympathetic to all kinds of liberty. They don't really want the UN to take over for the US in invading and occupying other countries. Like some anti-war proponents, they would just like to see the US get out of the world's business. You know, it's so funny. Um, before you move on, I just wanted to point that out. How the reason that there's all these, a lot of these wars are going on and the United States is involved in any of them is because we've become so involved in other people's business, centralizing the United States as the world police. And those same people who recognize that the, the problem is the United States getting in other people's business through the centralization of uh, the police of the world want an even bigger centralized government to do the exact same thing as the United States. So it, it's just, I find it a little bit 
humorous, sad, depressing, whatever yeah. you want, however you want to look at it for a lot of anti-war groups. But I, I digress. I apologize, Nick. Well, he, he starts out the article by pointing out that for the most part, in things like science fiction or, or speculative fiction about the future, uh, people will talk about utopias um, as being characterized by a world government on the grounds that presumably the people of the Earth evolved past the, uh, the confines of race and a nation state, and it's everybody's happy, they wear jumpsuits, they fly around on jetpacks. And the, the other extreme is usually when they, they predict some kind of a dystopia, a bad future, Sure. They'll talk about it being very tribal or very decentralized, and that's a bad thing. Of course, he's pointing out such examples as H.G. Wells, who was a, a socialist. I mean, he was a notorious global socialist, and he wanted a one-world government. So that's not, not too surprising. Um, but even such publications as the Financial Times are now talking about this. It's not alternative media. And um, their foreign affairs columnist over there, Gideon Rockman, uh, started out his article about globalization like, like this. I've never believed that there's a secret United Nations plot to take over the U.S. I've never seen black helicopters hovering in the sky above Montana, but for the first time in my life, I think the formation of some sort of world government is plausible. Now, a lot of people are talking about global governments and global regulation, the need for global regulation, as part of the whole credit mess. So this is actually out there. Um, what he's trying to do there is basically marginalize people who don't want one world government as being kooky because now he's trying to legitimize the idea of one world government but kind of attack the people who have some doubts. Um, he goes on to talk about what he thought it might look like. He said an entity with state-like characteristics backed by a body of laws. The European Union has already set up a continental government for 27 countries which could be a model. The EU has a supreme court, a currency, thousands of pages of law a large civil service, and the ability to deploy a military force. So could the European be made, model go global? Uh, there are th some reasons for thinking it might. And one of those is that the UN is, um, the UN High Commissioner, or I'm sorry, um, the, uh, uh, a group that calls itself Managing Global Insecurity uh, is call calling for the creation of a UN High Commissioner um, for counter-terrorist activity, and the idea is to create a 50,000 strong UN army, countries would pledge their troops to the peacekeeping force, but it wouldn't work like it does now where the countries can say we're not going to send our troops there. Once countries pledge their troops to this sort of pool of soldiers, they would be on the UN's first call. So they would be under the UN command first, national command second. That sounds so, like uh, we would have no representation there and neither would anyone. Uh, the, what it comes down down to is the more you centralize things, the more they suck. And we were talking about something similar with the financial crisis. Ron Paul was speaking of it on a recent edition of Free Minds Radio. Um, it's just total crap. And if you want to see more uh, of it, read into the article. Check out the for uh, the the, the uh, show content at the forums at forum.freemindstv.com. But for now, we are out of time. Uh, it's been a pleasure here. I hope you guys are enjoying and having a safe holiday season. We will be back next week with an all-new episode of Free Minds TV. Join us uh, this Sunday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We will be live with a new episode of Free Minds Radio. For now, it's been Toby here with you. And Nick. Have a great night and safe travels. Free Minds TV is brought to you in part by AnarchyInYourHead.com, a comic about freedom. When it comes to politics, they hate just about everyone, so they're bound to make fun of someone that you don't like eventually. AnarchyInYourHead.com, that's AnarchyInYourHead.com.